this is this is quite an honest and um, presentation um, from my perspective. Um, just sharing with you some of the highs and lows and, and um, my experiences um, through para um, archery over the past seven years. So I was just sharing my screen with you because my intro is on there as well. So um, and then um, I might feel a bit calmer when I can't see 108 boxes in front of me. <laughs> Thanks, Ricky. We're all friends on the group. You'll find that it's a very <laughs> friendly group that you don't you know, have anything to worry about. So. Um, so tonight I'm just going to be um, doing a, a, a webinar on Paralympic and Disability Archery. Um, and kind of the overview I'm going to go through is a bit about who I am and why the hell should I be talking to you tonight. Um, a bit about my journey and what I've found over the past seven years. Um, we're talking around my philosophy to coaching and working with um, Paralympic archers. A bit of an explanation around why this session is called Paralympic and Disability Archery and what the differentiator there is. Um, I had a number of questions regarding classification. Um, so I am going to cover some classification, but this isn't a classification presentation. And I know there will be more questions than answers, but hopefully I can give you a bit of an insight into what is, um, Sorry, Ricky. Um, your mic then just fell off a little bit. It just went a little oh, bit quiet. So, sorry, I try to stay closer. Okay. Um, so yeah, around classification, um, and like I said, I'm not going to be going into every detail. It's just too big a topic. It could have its own um seminar. Um, but I'll touch on kind of the important things and, and try and cover the things that were asked in the questions. There was a question around the progression ladder, so I'm going to try and. Um, cover that. Um, also, questions came in around um, the difference between the recurve and compound. So I'm going to cover some of the considerations there. And also, um, somebody asked about where they can get additional information from. Um, so I'm going to cover some of the resources that I use or, or would steer people towards um, at the end. And this will all be made available to you afterwards. So you'll be able to get on all the links and, and all the resources that I share. So a bit about me. Who am I? Well, I'm currently the lead Paralympic coach um, for Archery GB. Um, that isn't the head coach. I don't oversee the programme. I don't oversee the other coaches. Um, and I don't oversee all of the athletes. I primarily work with four athletes at the moment, um, where I um, coach them on a one-to-one -one basis. And at the moment, they're all in the compound open category. I have worked um, across a number of the categories, um, but at the moment that's where I am. The the lead bit around um, my job title um, refers to um, the the planning work that I do. So I do a lot of the planning for the program, um, and that will involve um, training camps and individual performance plans. I also work alongside our lead physio and our performance support manager. Um, working on special projects. So projects that I'm currently involved in is around female health and the effect of um, periods on female athletes, um, skin health and the breakdown of skin and preventing that, in, especially in hot climates. Um, also been working around um, a special wheelchair project and we're also doing a lot around heat and humidity and travelling jet lag. Looking forward to Tokyo um, 2021 now. Um, so that's kind of a, a bit of a background on what I do for the program. Um, I have been an archer for 30 years um, this May. So yeah, oh, definitely 30 years now. Um, the first 16 were recurve and the past 14 years have been compound. Though I won't lie, I don't think I've picked up my bow in the past year. I, I, I spend more time shooting the athletes both, I think, than I do mine. Um, so yeah. Um, but still class myself as a compound archer. I'm um, an ex-international athlete and medalist as well. I represented Great Britain um, with a recurve back when I was a junior. Uh, and uh, more recently, I've represented Great Britain and won several medals um, in the compound class. I'm also a bow technician. Um, I know my way around a bow um, and how to build a bow. And I've worked for both Quicks and 
Merlin and um, that's kind of how I got into this job so um, yeah just to be clear who am I not I'm not a disability expert yes I work with para athletes yes my job title is lead Paralympic coach I am not a disability expert and probably never would ever be able to class myself as a disability expert and I don't have all the answers that you know there will be a lot of questions that I don't necessarily have the answers for um the reality is my world is quite small um I work within a program which has 13 athletes um, I know a lot about them and their disabilities now but the wider world there's, there's so many and, and two athletes with the same disability are completely different so I'm, I don't have all the answers I, I don't know how to, to fix every um, disability problem um, with, when it comes to archery um, but I can often point you in the direction of somebody who can. So just to take you through a bit of my journey, um, so this technically is my journey. Back in 2013, um, I was working at Merlin Archery uh, as a bow technician and, and doing some coaching there. And I was asked um, to help coach a, a project for W1, um, primarily women. Um, and that was based upon my philosophies around shot execution and um, my philosophies around um, coaching women um, and and the kind of different um, things we need to consider um, with women uh, and as well as my compound technical knowledge because at the time we needed to do a lot of, of bow work and, and there was a lot of being able to get the more disabled athletes that, that we've worked with to be able to shoot as close to um, as close to normal technique as possible. Um, then in 2014, I was appointed and, and took up a, a, a part-time um, but permanent position as the compound bow specialist for Archer GB. Uh, spent most of my time working with the W1 category back then. In 2016, I attended the Rio Paralympics as assistant coach um, and had a fantastic experience there and, and we were obviously very successful. In 2017, I was then appointed um, senior Paralympic coach and then at the end of 2019 appointed to the lead coach position and this looks a nice very linear um, trajectory you know what I've done um, straightforward um, but the reality was my journey didn't really look like that at all um, my journey was a, a lot bumpier than that and um, yeah a lot more challenging um, so in 2013 I started working with the Paris and at that point I realized I knew nothing about disabilities. I didn't didn't really appreciate well how they impacted people, not just physically but mentally too. You know, uh, athletes who have been born with disabilities may you know could have, could have suffered a, a life of of bullying and exclusion, for example. Um, but somebody else who's been born with a condition, you know, could have been brought up completely differently or have a very different view of the world. And, and the same with people who um, acquired a disability, so lost a leg or an arm or something or um, suffered an illness which led to something. And, and some of those look at, look at life and, and, and it, what's happened to them affects them mentally too. So it was a quite a steep learning curve at that point in time. There was a lot of um, knowledge that I needed to acquire um, you know and I didn't I didn't get things right you know and I still don't always get things right you know I'm constantly learning and, and will constantly be learning Um I found it hard as well you know I'd never really I'd shot with disabled archers and um, at competitions a number of times but never really spoken to them about their disability it would always just be an archery chat and um, so I at first I was like oh I don't ask them you know what if what if they're offended by me asking about it and actually the biggest bit of feedback I got was we want you to know about our disability we want you to know how it affects us um and and yeah that that that's one of the the most important things about understanding and asking that so that was a big learning for me when I first started um, between the periods of 2014 to 2016, I started on a UK sport programme. It's called the Paracoach to Rio programme. 
and it was there when I started to work with um, specialist um, coach developers from UK Sport and work with para coaches from a number of different sports that I began to realise that that what I was doing probably wasn't really really what what a lot of other people were talking about coaching. It was more instructing someone on technique changes and adjusting equipment, and that's what I thought. That's what I thought coaching was back then, and maybe that's because that's all the coaching I'd ever received, um, and that's what people came to me for. Um, but it was only at that point in time that I started to think, mm, am I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I really know what coaching is, and and it led it led to quite a lot of angst actually in me to to really understand what what am I doing? Why why am I doing this? Am I doing this right? Um, and then in 2017 came a bit of a uh, the, we uh, we had the high of Rio but then we had the low after Rio um, which there always is there's always a low after a major event and I did a lot of self-reflection and um, yeah spent a lot of time with coaches from other sports and doing a lot of research and I started to realize that, that I hadn't really been coaching the past four years I'd been instructing and, and spoon feeding and to be honest some of that was needed you know we were dealing with a very new green crop of athletes that we'd pretty much you know picked with zero archery experience and, and taken them to Paralympic gold medals so there was a need for instructing and there was a need for for spoon feeding as such but that wasn't coaching and moving into this next cycle we had a bunch of athletes who had a minimum of four years experience under the belt and they needed coaching um, and that and I've, I've really felt over the past three years um, that that's that's where I've put the most work in and now I realize what what coaching is um, and um, yeah that I've, I've completely rewritten my philosophy um, which which took months to do to be honest and, and again was all um, stemmed from another UK sport course but um, it's completely changed the way I work and the way I work with the athletes and I think it's made me significantly better um, and, and the athletes better. Um, so, yeah, so that's just kind of a bit about my journey um, that I just thought I'd share with you um, kind of the key learnings, I suppose, from my journey. And some of these are going to be like, I'm not trying to teach people to suck eggs. Like these sound obvious. They really do. And when I wrote them down, I'm like, they sound obvious. But then I'm like, I got these wrong. I've got these wrong in the past and I still get them wrong. So please don't be offended by some of these. Um, do not take away a, a, an athlete's independence. It sounds really obvious. And of course we go, of course we don't do that. And I thought, I didn't do that. And then I think back about the times that instead of saying, can I help you with that? Or do you need any help? I've gone, here, let me take that. Thinking I'm helping. When actually, they don't they don't need that help. Um, just be I think it's naturally built into us if we see someone struggling or finding something harder than us that we try and that we want to help that we want to make something easy for other people but but the athletes I've worked with you know th this is their way of life this is how they deal with things this is their independence and, and it's taken a lot of learning that actually they don't want that taken away you know so now I'll ask do you want any help? If they say no, then I will quite happily walk next to them whilst they carry three massive bags on them and push themselves along because that's their independence. That's what they want to do. Um, so I know it sounds simple and I know everyone's probably thinking, oh, I'll never do that. But still sometimes I, I, I'll go to get something and then remind myself, no, just check that they want that help because if they want help, they, will ask, they know they can ask me for it. So um, put the responsibility over to them. Um, as I've already touched on, the need to understand an athlete's condition and abilities, and I'm going to touch on this a bit, and that, that's their actual and perceived limitations, because there is a difference, um, and, and we'll touch on that on a further slide, but understanding um, the athlete's condition and how it affects them, and that's not just the how, how they're going to hold the bow or how they're going to hold the release aid, that's Oh right, you need to be able to go to the toilet this frequently, or um, 
you can't you can't be sitting on your cushion and you can't be strapped in and sitting down because you you need to be able to lift yourself every hour to ensure you don't get pressure sores things like that it's, it, it's silly li- not silly little things but it's the little things that we probably don't consider when we think about artery and, and coaching and that 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 actually make a massive difference on on what they're able to do um like with any athlete understanding motivations and goals um don't I think I think sometimes it can be a, a thing that if someone starts archery and they're in a wheelchair then they've done it because they want to go to the Paralympics it's not always the case and I know again that sounds really straightforward and that but you know I've made the mistake in assuming that some because somebody is there in front of me that that's what they want to do but it might not be you know a lot of people take up the sport for recreation so understanding what their motivations and goals are and actually are they realistic um and that's not saying tell somebody they can't they can't they'll never get there because you know just be realistic about what it's going to take to get there so shooting you know you, someone does come in and they want to go to the paralympic shooting once a week isn't going to do it you know you've got to be clear on actually what it's going to take to get there um and don't and don't assume that we're going to go into classification later don't assume as well on the flip side that somebody goes for a classification and they don't classify that that means that that they don't want to be a competitive archer just just because they can't go to the paralympics doesn't mean they can't go to the olympics doesn't mean they can't go to a world championships you know there's nothing there's nothing standing in their way of that you know they have, they have to work hard um very hard but but it's not it doesn't mean that, that just because they don't classify that their ability to be competitive and shoot at a very high standard isn't there um and about the athlete coach relationship and i know that like hannah mentioned my colleague andrea gales is going to um be talking about this next week but that has been a, a key critical finding for me about the developing of um the athlete coach relationships and the relationships i now have with the, the athletes i work with and it's taken time like it, it doesn't happen overnight um you need to build the trust um and that, that's so critical um so yeah and andrea will touch on that more next week but for me the understanding of that relationship and the importance of that relationship has been a massive learning for me and the biggest learning i suppose or the biggest tip i've got is uh, never underestimate the power of a obviously now socially distanced coffee um so many of these things can can be done by going for a coffee before you start anything how how often i know i'm guilty of it i re- i need some help with my archery can you ha- can you have a look or could you work with me i, I need a coach and you, you jump straight into oh let's have a look at your technique no no i don't do that anymore right let's go for a coffee let's talk about this let, let me understand you let's find out what you want let's see if i can offer what you want but at that point that's when you can understand their abilities their condition their motivations and goals just one coffee from two meters apart in an open space um can give you all that information to start off that relationship on a fantastic footing so yeah get the coffee in okay so i mentioned previously around actual and perceived blockers um just to touch on this um and it's it's something that that I have come across a number of times. So I thought it was worth sharing. So, obviously, working with with someone with a disability, there are actual physical blockers. There are things that they will not be able to do. It's either because it's physically not possible, it could be dangerous, or or there's a high chance of it causing an injury for them to try or to do. However, there are a lot of times I've worked with people, and their blockers have been perceived by them and I've, I've put a picture of Matt Stutzman here um, because I think he's a, he's a, he could have easily assumed that he can't do archery because he has no arms but he does archery and he wins Paralympic medals and is phenomenal and he has no arms so sometimes a, an athlete believes they can't do something um, and actually they can um, and it's about understanding and breaking down those blockers so i've had a number of athletes um i can't shoot i can't shoot a hand release or a back tension release because i'm w1 
well, just because you're W1 doesn't mean you can't. So they, it's about understanding. So why do they think it isn't possible? Is it because it's perception, because they've not seen anybody else do it? Is it because they assume they can't do it or they don't necessarily understand how something works? Then I always try and might explain why I think it's possible and, and share with them how we can make it safe to try. Um, and this may take time. They're not always going to go, oh, yeah, I'll just try it because, you know, it's going to take a bit of convincing or might take some baby steps to get them there. But we, we I've worked with a number of athletes that that I need I'm, I'm a, I need to have a lightweight bow because I'm W1. And then they see another W1 who's got the latest Hoyt, which is significantly heavier. And they're like, oh, maybe maybe I can do that. And then all of a sudden the whole program shooting heavy bows. And it, it, it's just amazing how that that's kind of filtered through. It's like this perceived blocker, um, and it's about breaking that down. And, and like I said, it's all it's all about understanding their condition, and it's all about understanding them as a person and how you can try and break this down. But but yeah, there's the, a the two there's two different types of blockers, and um, a lot of the time, um people have been told that they can't do things because of certain conditions and and I like to try and then um, try and show that they, they can um, and try get them as close to um, a normal shooting technique as possible wherever possible okay so just going to talk you a bit through my philosophy now so like I said everything changed over the past three or four years um, and yeah I, Rather than being an instructor, I I am a big listener now, and because this picture in the background shows a lot more like what a coaching session with me looks like now. <laughs> Generally, me sitting on the floor on a Danage cube, and um, often with a notebook in hand, um, taking notes, um, because the athlete is the expert in their disability, and they need to be the expert in their shooting. And again, it's something that sounds really, really simple and straightforward, but a really good example of um of this is um I worked with an athlete who would always just want me to watch them and that's fine I'm happy to to watch an athlete and then they'd do oh what did I do wrong on that one and I'm like I'm not, I'm not really sure um and I was trying to understand that I needed to know what they felt and I, I, I'm a I do like my open questions like well, what what did it feel like how did it feel and, and, and continue asking questions around that. And, and I think it was getting a bit frustrated. So I set up a, a session the following week whereby um, I got the athlete to shoot 72 arrows and we filmed the arrows from two different angles. Um, we used the, the technician and um, I plotted the arrows and the athlete had to give me feedback on every single shot, whether it was a good shot, an excellent shot, a not so good shot. I think we rated them out of 10. Um, so what we did, um, so after the session, I got up a, a selection of the shots um, and I said, you know, um, have a look at these shots. What do you think the difference is? And I'm like, oh, no, two great shots. I'm like, well, that one you rated a 10 out of 10 and that one you rated a 4 out of 10. I said it was a rubbish shot. What are you seeing? Oh, I'm like, Th that's what I'm seeing. That's why I'm asking you what it feels like um, because you're the only one the athlete's the only one who can feel they can only feel what's going on in the shot they're the only one who can feel the pressures the only one who can feel it you know what's working we can see things yeah absolutely we can see things we can see their back we can see their elbow position but we can also show them that they can't show us their feelings but we can show them what we see so they can become the expert in seeing what we're seeing and adding that extra dynamic of feeling what they're feeling. So that's a big one of my philosophies is around showing them that what I see, but spending most of my time listening and noting what they're feeling um, because that's what they need to remember when things start to go wrong. How did I feel when it was going great? Um, I coach an athlete on how they want and need to be coached. So. A lot of people say, oh, you know, athletes should have full autonomy or they should be responsible. Some of them don't. Some of them that I work with, they all have different levels of want and need. Some of them want to be very independent and want to do all of the kit changes themselves and, and things like that. And 
that is absolutely fine with me. I absolutely 100% back them. But then there's other athletes who want guidance, who want me to help them. I always try and increase autonomy, but it differs, you know, that everyone's different. So I don't assume that they all should have the same level of autonomy. They have what they have. And if we, if I can incrementally increase it with those who, who rely too much on me, I will do. I want the reliance to go down and down on me and up and up on them but they're just all at different levels. So don't just assume that, that everybody can do, do the same thing. For some athletes, I still need to write their timetable for them, like a school timetable each week, because it just blows their mind trying to think where they need to be and when they need to be there. And that, that is fine if that's what it takes for them. And that enables us to have quality sessions on the line and that they're on time for it. Well, so be it. Um, making it a safe environment to fail. And this is where the athlete coach relationship comes in so um, strongly. There's got to be that level of trust that when you are getting an athlete to do something or putting them under pressure, that if they fail, they feel safe in doing so, that they understand that it's a learning and how they're going to improve from it, not that they've failed. There's no point in failure if there's no learning. And again, it sounds straightforward and, and, and um, and that but in the past I don't think um there's always been um particularly you know where I work and, and that it's not always felt safe to fail so I now ensure that that those um those sessions are completely safe um for the athlete and they understand that failure is a part of a progression um and that it's a good thing um so yeah, so that, that's part of my philosophy now. And then um, use resources. So I suppose one of, um, I think a lot of times it can be assumed that I'm the coach, so I should have all the answers. I don't have all the answers, especially not, um, especially not with so many different factors. Um, so the amount of times that things have been solved by someone down the club who doesn't coach, but they might have access to, um, I don't know, me mechanics equipment, for example, on, and how to build something. Um, for me, now, you know, I'm, I'm really lucky. I have work with a, a really close um, group of three lead coaches, and um, we have Kieran Carr, who's done the, some of the previous things as our technician. So I've got some really great... Um, people around me to go to that if I, I don't know how to solve a problem um, I can go to them but I also really like using um, people who haven't got a clue about archery they have a bit of a clue but I'll always ask you know our physio or our strength and conditioning coach or our biomech or even our program manager just just have a look tell me what you think because so often do we get focused on the minutiae is the anchor point the same every time is this you know that we, we sometimes don't notice the other bits of the body that that we probably not paying attention to but can have a massive impact um so so kind of use resources use people around you and try get those outside views that, that aren't skewed with archery knowledge because um sometimes they've been really 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 vital um in working and and, and improving athletes and about thinking outside the box, which I know sounds really obvious when you're working with para athletes um, or dis disability athletes, um, but thinking about outside the box, but on the caveat of don't lose sight of the box. Now, sometimes great ideas come from outside the box. You need to think outside. What what could we do differently? Like, um, one of the questions I had was relating to um, W1 athlete losing grip. Okay, so there's a number of things we could think about. We could think about, well, how could we get them to draw the bow without grip? What releases could we use? Could we just fasten their current release aid to their wrist to take that off? And they don't have any they don't have any muscle in their hand. Okay, so maybe we can attach it to the elbow. And that's what we've done with a lot of people. We've managed to attach um, releases um, so that they're drawn back with the elbow. Um, but sometimes our ideas can go a little bit ahead of us and, and we lose sight of actually what, what we're trying to achieve, which we're still trying to achieve a shot, a good shot that's shot with 
the correct form that's in line and sometimes we can, we can go so far outside the box that we forget what we're trying to do um so don't lose sight of the box um always try bring it back to trying to be as close to good technique as possible um rather than getting carried away with with some wacky wacky ideas um so now on to oh, why that not worked Okay. Um, so the title of my presentation was Paralympic Archery and Disability Archery. Um, so I just wanted to just clarify why there's a differentiator there. Um, so disability archery is inclusivity. It's about participation of people for all disabilities. Um, a lot of the funding comes from Sport England and it's about um, getting disabled people out and active and archery is a fantastic sport to be able to do that and um, they can enjoy club environments they can be competitive it's one of those sports as we all know that we can all shoot on the line all together and really enjoy the sport together with no um with no like big you know divides between us so disability archery is a fantastic um sport for people to to get active um paralympic archery is different though so paralympic archery is when we talk about paralympic archery that is the elite level of the sport and it's only for certain classifiable impairments so we'll go into what the classifiable impairments are later but when when we talk about paralympic archery or the paralympics it is different to disability archery in the fact that it is just that that very high level um, part of the sport for people with certain impairments to be able to go to the Paralympic Games. Um, and we'll all touch more on what that is later. Sitting somewhere in between is, is VI archery, visually impaired archery. Um, and why it sits in between is it is classifiable. It's on the um, World Archery and the IPC um, classifiable um, impairment list, but it's currently not a Paralympic sport at the moment. So um, VI archers can now attend um, world championships and European championships, para world you know, in European championships and even some of the European um, European legs now. Um, but at, at, at present, it's not Paralympic sport. They are very much trying to get it into the Paralympics, but at the moment, they're just struggling with numbers of participants. Um, and we'll touch on VI archery and kind of where to go for more information on that a little bit later, because um, as it sits outside um, of Paralympic archery, um, it's not something that I have a lot of dealing with, but I can direct you to where you can go for further information on that. So classification, I uh, had a quite a few questions around classification. So I'm just going to share um, this video with you, which I think is a fantastically um, great video that uh, is made by Paralympics GB, which just gives a bit of an an overview of what classification is in Paralympic sport. Classification is crucial to para sport. Without it, competitive sport is not possible or meaningful. It establishes who can and cannot compete and groups athletes into sport classes. Disabled people who are not eligible to compete at the Paralympic Games can continue to enjoy sport, but they are not on a Paralympic journey. The classification system of each sport is different, but its aim is always the same, to minimise the impact of someone's impairment on the outcome of competition. Classification might seem complicated, but so are people. No two para-athletes are completely identical. Athletes may look different to their competitors, as there is a spectrum of impairments in each class. To be classified, Athletes must submit medical information, go through sport and impairment specific tests, and they may be observed in competition. During the classification process, athletes must give their best effort and a true reflection of their impairment. Athletes can choose someone to accompany them during this process. Ooh, all right. Classification is crucial to para sport. Without it, competitive sport is not possible Sorry, where did that cut off? Um, not sure why that happened. 
Where did we get to? Comparing competition results. Personal best or season. Sorry, I'm going to replay it. I do apologise for you all. I know it's only three minutes, but for some reason it cut off. So. Right. Classification is crucial to para sport. Without it, competitive sport is not possible or meaningful. It establishes who can and cannot compete and groups athletes into sport classes. Disabled people who are not eligible to compete at the Paralympic Games can continue to enjoy sport if they are not on a Paralympic journey. The classification system of each sport is different, but its aim is always the same, to minimise the impact of someone's impairment on the outcome of competition. Classification might seem complicated, but so are people. No two para-athletes are completely identical. Athletes may look different to their competitors, as there is a spectrum of impairments in each class. To be classified, athletes must submit medical information, go through sport and impairment-specific tests, and they may be observed in competition. During the classification process, athletes must give their best effort and a true reflection of their impairment. Athletes can choose someone to accompany them during this process. To enter a national competition, the athlete must go through national classification, run by the sport's national governing body. This should mirror international classification as much as possible. To enter an international competition, the athlete must undergo international classification, run by the sport's international federation. This outcome always overrules national classification. Classifiers work in panels of at least two and make decisions together. They decide which class an athlete competes in. They are trained by the International Federation of that sport and must have relevant professional qualifications. For example, they could be a physiotherapist or an ophthalmologist. Intentional misrepresentation, where someone fakes their level of impairment is cheating. If it's proven, athletes or staff can face a maximum four-year ban. Comparing competition results, personal bests or season bests on its own is not evidence that an athlete has been misrepresenting their impairment. An athlete may change class for a number of reasons during their career. This does not mean that they were misrepresenting their impairment before they changed class. Depending on the nature of their impairment, an athlete could be classified multiple times during their career. An international federation can put an athlete through the classification process again if it thinks the athlete may have been given an incorrect class. Athletes may need to go through the classification process again when there are changes made to the sports classification rules. Classification. Cut out on me again. I do apologise, but so ju just to clarify, so um, so classification is different for every sport. Um, so somebody who classifies in one sport may not classify um in archery. So um, it all depends upon the the so the International Paralympic Committee set what the um eligible impairments are, and then the world governing body so world archery in our case then set what the minimum requirements are to take part as, as a para um archer um so somebody who may be able to be part of a wheelchair basketball team or um yeah something like that could classify for that sport um but they may not for archery um just because of what the what the point differentials are so we'll get onto that a little bit later um i would always recommend to get it done as soon as an, an archer indicates that they want to take part in competitive archery um and this will just enable them to know what class they sit in or if they do sit in a class and if they need any assistive devices such as the use of a wheelchair a stool uh, something to help their release um 
a bow, you know, a bow strap, something like that. It just means that they are authorized and, and written on their classification card so that if it's requested at any national level event, um, uh, equipment inspection, they can they can show that they are um, um, permitted to have those assistive devices. Um, just to be clear that that one of the classes is not eligible and um, that doesn't mean you're not disabled like that is that is not what it means it just means you're not eligible to take part at Paralympic events in that sport um, not that you're not disabled so just to be very very clear on that I would always advise against guessing someone's classification um, because um, there is there is so much um, medical evidence that needs to be provided and read and then physical tests that need to happen and um yeah it's it's amazing now how you can think one thing and actually the results are something very different so never guess someone's classification um always always get them to go for an official classification and um it may be we're going to go on to what um are the eligible impairments in a mo in a moment but um, even if an athlete is well aware that they don't have an eligible impairment, if they, for safety reasons, need an assistive device, for example, if they you require the use of a wheelchair or they require the use of a stool or something like that, though they don't classify, they, a classification will enable them to get that piece of assistive equipment um, verified by the classifier and therefore they will then be able to use it at competition. So on to the classifiable conditions. So there are ten there are ten classifiable impairments under the IPC rules. However, only six of them apply in archery. Um, the first one is in, uh, impaired muscle power, and I'm just gonna I, I'm pretty much just reading what what the World Archery um, text says because I'm like I said earlier, I'm not a physiotherapist, I'm not a classifier, I'm not an expert in in disability or or, or um, people's disabilities but just as a guide um, and also to let you know that all of this information will soon be going on to the Archer GB website um, so you, you can access this um, or your athletes can access this and it will also um, provide links to where you can find more information on it so um, impaired muscle power so um, that's re re reduced force generated by muscles or muscle groups such as muscles of one limb or the lower half of the body as caused, for example, by spinal cord injuries or spina bifida or polio. So examples of that are then. Um, impaired passive range of movement. Um, so the range of movement in one or more joints is reduced permanently um, through um, things like arthro, uh, I can't say it, arthrogoposis, um, hypermobility of joints, joints instability in acute conditions such as arthritis are not considered as eligible impairments and we'll go on to some of the examples of impairments that are eligible in a moment. Loss of limb or limb deficiency and um, so that's the total or partial absence of bones joints or as a consequence of trauma for example a car accident an illness such as bone cancer or congenital limb de um, deficiency. Hypotonia um, is an um, abnormal increase in muscle tension and reduced ability of a muscle to stretch due to a neurological condition such as cerebral palsy, a brain injury or, or multiple cirrhosis. But that condition has to be diagnosed. Um, an undiagnosed neurological condition causing that would not classify. It needs to have a diagnosis. Um, ataxia, which is a lack of coordination of muscle movements due to a neurological condition again needs to be diagnosed such as cerebral palsy, a brain injury or multiple sclerosis and the final one is visual impairment. So an example of non-eligible impairments and conditions. So pain is not classifiable and, um, and nor are conditions that um, cause pain um, such as um, complex regional pain syndrome or fibromyalgia um, low muscle tone, hypermobility of joints, joint instability, so a, a reoccurring dislocating shoulder doesn't isn't a classifiable condition, um, impaired motor reflex functions, impaired muscle endurance, 
conditions such as chronic fatigue syndrome that cause fatigue aren't classifiable, um, conditions that cause um, hypermobility or hypotonia, and psychological or psychogenic um, conditions such as um, P, uh, yeah, post traumatic stress and um, things like that aren't, aren't class as classifiable. So, um, like I said, just because somebody has those conditions doesn't mean they can't take it, take part in archery or competitive archery. They just won't classify um, with those conditions um, for, um, for a Paralympic classification. Just to touch on visual, impair, visual impairment, so um, like I said earlier, it's currently not a Paralympic sport. Um, there are more international competitions now. Um, they're now featuring at the World and European Championships. There was a question around lack of competition um, for blind archers, um, and I completely agree. I really don't see what, what the problem is. It, it's such an easy event to put on because you don't even have to move the target. Um, even if you're doing a feeder, you don't have to move the target. So it's, it's just change the face. Um, so yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure why more more competitions aren't including it. Um, visual impaired archery is um, overseen by. It is of, it's obviously part of Archery GB, but the British Blind Sport um, Archery Committee um, tend to um, be the point of contact in the UK. Uh, British Blind Sport um, are the ones who you go to to get a uh, visual impairment classification um, also they're the ones who manage um, the British team when they come away so they don't come away as um, part of the whole para team they come away with their own management because often their competition duration is significantly shorter so they'll often fly out later and fly home earlier um, there are a number there's three classifications that are international B1, B2 and B3 uh, I believe there's also B4 and B5, but they don't um, come under um, international competition. B1 is normally a category on its own. That is the most visually impaired. That is um, zero vision or shadows or anything. Uh, B2 and B3 um, are generally um, put together. Um, you can shoot compound or recurve. You shoot against one another and male and female as well, I believe. So it's all just every, everybody's in, everybody's classed as the same, um, and it's just the one distance, just 30 metres. So, um, so yeah, that, that's just a bit on visual impairment. But there's a link to British Blind Sport at the end um, for anybody who wants any further information on that. So just a bit about the process for um, getting a physical classification in the UK. So I'm talking about a national classification here. Um, so um, a national classification is carried out by one classifier in the UK. We don't have a panel in the UK. Um, there's one that, that at R3 GB um, that we primarily use. He used to be the physio for um, the GB team. Um, and um, his classification has been very accurate. But like anything, people get things wrong. And, and also, the classification rule book is just a guide and it's open for well it's not a guide but it is open for interpretation so there has obviously been cases where um where it's not you know someone's got he is either, you know someone's been classified and then they go to an international and they're not classified and vice versa so um there is always scope and you'll find that an international panel can take a very different view on things and it's often one of the things that are probably most appealed at international competitions um, classes that people sit in and also um, the um, assistive devices that they're allowed um, tend to be the things that are most appealed against um, in para archery. Um, so this is just an, like I said, some of this information is going to be going on. A more detailed version of this is going to be going on onto the website hopefully in the next few weeks. Um, so this is just a um, just for you. So um, the process is first of all contact. So at the moment the contact point is the performance unit and Steph Kelly at our performance unit, and she will put you in touch with um, a classifier, um, and they will provide you with um, the forms you need to get completed, a medical intake form, um, and then the athlete will need to gather all their medical information from their GP and their consultants um, to um, back up their um, eligible condition. 
um, they will then attend the, a consultation um, and to that they need they can bring somebody with them someone can be in the room with them um, but they also need to bring all assistive devices and all of their archery kit because they may be um, asked to shoot because um, being somebody um, actually do the sport um, is part of the assessment and, and can be part of the assessment because um, it needs to see how the impairment affects the sport um, and at this uh, it will be um, like the video said it's normally someone with a um, physio background or something like that and they'll they'll carry out a number of standard physical tests and and a, a, a person um, like me for example I don't have any impairments nothing no medical uh, impairment so I have full range of mo movement and full strength in my wrists and my ankles and my knees and my hips um, so with, for all of those areas I would score maximum points so for example the lower body um, if, it, if I was assessed I would score a maximum of 180 points now to get a classification um, an archer needs to um, have uh, have points taken away. So, if um, you know once you start to get a reduced range of motion, you go down to a four or a three or a two. Or if there's absolutely no 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 movement or no strength there, you you go down to a one. And it's those dropping of points. So on further slides, you'll see like an athlete with a a points loss of fifty, and that just means that they've lost that amount of points. They they've got that much of an impact. 50 points worth of impairment out of 180 total points for the lower body to enable them to, to hit the minimum criteria. Um, so I'm not going into full detail about that. That can all be found on the um, World Archery Classification um, ha Handbook um, if you really do have um, want to understand how that's assessed. Um, so they attend the consultation and then at that point they will receive the um, a classification status and we're going to go into what those are um, and it'll also record any assisted devices they've been permitted so again this is why uh, even if you don't necessarily have an eligible condition it's still important because at this point you will get even if you're not eligible you'll still get a classification card stating that you're not eligible and the results of your tests and also what um what assistive devices you're allowed uh, and they'll generally be on the grounds of safety um, and that could be a stool or it could be a wheelchair and then at that point you can go off and compete um, and a question did come in around um, considerations for competition for disabled athletes so I'd say um, having a classification card with you um, is definitely something you need to make sure you have when you go into a competition because at equipment inspection this can be requested so um, once you've been given a classification card always make a electronic copy take a picture on your phone on your iPad whatever you're going to have with you and then we always recommend taking multiple copies and also laminate a copy to keep in your uh, bow box because as we know it doesn't always stay dry um, so yeah so laminate laminate a copy and then if it's requested you can show that at um, equipment inspection Things to also consider is the need for an agent. Um, if you don't have some, if an athlete doesn't have somebody that they can take with them to a competition to collect their arrows, um, let the organizer know in advance, and um, because they can either um, arrange for a volunteer to come and help collect the arrows and score for them, or they can speak to their target companions to check that they are happy um, with that um, and that they're happy to score and collect for that athlete. Um, make sure you let the tournament organizer know um, if you you know make sure that athlete lets the tournament organizer know that they can't come off the line if that's the case because anybody with a stool or in a wheelchair aren't going to come off the line every end so it means that they just need to take up a, a whole um, whole side of the target so if you let the if they let the organizer know in advance then they can make sure the target list um, is suitable and it stops any awkwardness because it's horrible if, if an athlete turns up and and they've been put on with someone and they're going to have an awkward conversation about how they can't get off the line or then everyone stands too close to them and they've got someone bum in their face and it's just not nice um 
So, um, so yeah, just make sure that, that they let the organisers know in advance that they will be staying on the line, and if they need any help with um, collecting of arrows, um, also consider um, making sure that, that an athlete you're working with when going to a competition takes significantly more layers than you would. Because sitting on that line, it can be freezing cold. They're not warming up as they go to the target like somebody walking to the target would. They're not get they're not able to get off the line in between ends in shelter from the wind and rain. They're getting wet, they're getting cold. So always make sure that they've got extra they take extra clothes with them. And then the same when it, it's sunny, make sure there's an umbrella or make sure there's sun cream because again they're not able to get off the line, they're not able to get in the shade. And um, so just a few considerations for um disabled athletes when they, they go and compete because um yeah seeing seeing soggy freezing athletes is, is, isn't nice um and it's not it'll stop them enjoying competition so make sure they're they're well prepared when they go out for the first competitions um, so the archery classification so just to get on because i know i've talked about things like w1 and that and that that might mean nothing for, for some people so um there's a standing class um, and that is for athletes um, yeah, who are able to stand. Um, again, it, 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 you don't need to read all this detail. Basically, you can you can be given a standing classification or a W2 classification and they are your open classification. So standing and W2 athletes will compete together in either open recurve or open compound categories. Um, and generally, they have near to perfect um, upper body, uh, arms and things like that um, and generally just have a lower body issues if they're a W2 or it could be for example a standing class completely perfect lower body um, but maybe uh, amputee or um, or condition um, with hands or arms um, that will enable standing class and um, the use of a stool is allowed in standing class as well but only if the classifiers permit it so don't don't assume that you need to have you need to be unsafe on your feet to be be permitted a um a stool um so yeah so those two classes are, are as one they compete compound and recurve open male female then the last category is w1 now this is the this is the most disabled category because an athlete to be in this category must have impairment in both lower limbs upper limbs and trunk um, and what the difference is is um for these athletes rather they sh they shoot as a compound so they'll most of them you know you can shoot recurve or compound bow in w1 class but nobody shoots recurve because compounds will, will just beat them um so that's the reality um so people shoot um compound bows but they have a maximum poundage allowance of 45 pounds and they can only use a recurve sight and pin and they can't use a peep sight or any back sight. Um, so they can use a release aid, can use a compound bow, must have a recurve sight and, um, and they're allowed a kisser but that's it, just one kisser but no, no peep sight, no lens, no magnifying lens. Um, and a maximum of 45 pounds um, they shoot at 50 meters like the um, like the compound open class do but they shoot on a full 10 zone size face and it's full 80 centimeter face rather than the reduced six zone faces um, they are also allowed more um, strapping um, so they're allowed to be strapped into the chair they're allowed things such as um, corsets and things like that um, they're allowed a lot more um, assistive devices because the loss of the core control means that most of them need to be held into their chair um, to stop them falling out of their chair from side to side. Um, yeah, and I saw a question actually pop through um, a bit earlier around um, the use of um, do, do athletes have different chairs for competing? And to be honest, most of them don't. Most of them adapt their day chairs. There's a few who are lucky to be able to have a, a shooting chair. But um, just taking, for example, on the Paralympic team, um, when we travel, taking two wheelchairs is, is a bit of a faff. So they'll generally have uh, either 
an interchangeable backrest or they may have side supports that they attach to their day chair and they may have a different cushion so a lot of the time they, they just adapt their day chair so whoever asked that i hope that answers your question normally we look at adapting a day chair and putting things onto a day chair to enable them to be comfy um for the rest of the week um, and yeah it just might be a different different backrest or different cushion that, that we take or, or add some side posts on um so just to, just to confirm that on a classification card like i said again not eligible may be on there that may be a classification it just means that they either don't have an eligible impairment or they don't meet the minimum criteria and you are still permitted assistive devices on the basis of safety so just to make that clear um, just to answer one of the other questions we got was around the progression ladder now i'm going to be completely honest with you it's there isn't a great system at the moment we're aware of that part of our um strategy for the next four to eight years is to put in place a much better clearer progression ladder um and much better resource further down the pathway at the minute all of our funding purely funds um the, the world-class program and doesn't allow for us to invest with the uk sport funding further down the path pathway it, it doesn't allow it we we try to get around as many things as we can obviously to try to get as many people involved but at the moment we don't have a great pathway and that's one of our big things that we want to sort out so just to be clear um the paralympic world class program is only for classified athletes but athletes with disabilities can shoot for the national team including at the olympics whether their impairment is classifiable or not and the picture in the background shows one of our current athletes jessica stretton um, who won a bronze medal at the um, world youth championships last year in madrid um, as at the able-bodied championships has also been um john stubbs and nathan mcqueen have shot for the able-bodied team danny brown was on the team with me and um, yeah we have had a number there's also the iranian lady um the marty um who competed for a run at the olympics and the paralympics in rio so um these things are you know it doesn't just because you're not classifiable doesn't mean that that your archery career can't be fantastic and competitive if you want it to be but the world-class program that i work on is purely for classified athletes to get to that level and to get noticed um it's really important that athletes shoot relative relevant rounds and submit them uh, we really need to see scores from a, a 50 meter round if they're a compound or a 70 meter round if they're a recurve and head to head it sounds harsh but scores for albions or portsmouth don't mean anything to us it, it, it's like it's like giving us something in a, in a different language and I know I've, I've been around obviously a long time and, and know kind of know that the level of, of some of those scores but we really need we really need these scores and, and people to just be displaying what they can do in the relevant rounds and the more competitions they can get to and the more evidence they can submit we can then start tracking that athlete and and we'll keep them on our radar um, and, and see how they progress a really another good way of getting noticed is, is attending the Archer GB Disability Championships. This um, the, it's generally always attended by one, if not all, of the coaches and program manager and that. So it's a really good opportunity um, to to be seen and and have your results seen by the people um, who you look at who's on the program and and we're looking for um, for talent that can be. Um, converted for Paris and LA and we'll be looking more openly for that over the next um, 12 to 18 months um, just to be aware that the world-class program is a semi-centralized program so we do generally require athletes to to be at Lillishaw three to four days each week um, there are exceptions where people um, have jobs or um, live further away we'll always try and make it individual for the athlete but just so that you know that, that that's kind of an expectation um, on somebody to, to be able to commit to that kind of level of training and like I said we're really looking to have a much clearer progression ladder so that people can go to and you can go to and understand how somebody gets from from joining a club to a podium because at the minute I, I completely fully accept that that isn't clear um, 
and just to be clear that, that we've talked about national classification international classification only takes part once an athlete makes it onto their first international shoot and that'll be that'll be the first thing that happens when they get out there before they're allowed to shoot competitive arrow um so just to be clear there um one of the other questions i received was around uh, recurve and, and compound and um what we think about compounds and, and i also saw um a question about beginners being given um club bows that are recurve and it's too long and I can't answer the rest of that question with regard to awards and things like that because that's completely out of my remit but maybe that's something Hannah can can look at with um in regard to that but just a few considerations on on when um when you've got an athlete and and you're having that discussion between you about which is the best way to go so um classification so obviously if if you've got an athlete and um you have a suspicion that they, they could potentially be um, a, a W1, for example. Um, like I said, if, if, they, if it's something they're going to want to do, get them classified. And then if it does come back as W1, then, then go for the compound bow because uh, a recurve just isn't going to be able to compete at that level um, at that level that, that there is internationally um, with a recurve. The classification's one of them. And, and also think about um trunk stability and, and things like that is, is, is a recurve athlete going to be able to maintain um their core and their posture um dependent on you know for example if they've got a spinal cord injury doesn't mean they can't it doesn't mean they can't have a strap for example but but just those kind of things to consider um draw length and string angle which is kind of what was picked up on earlier so yeah um someone in a wheelchair who needs a 70 inch bow because of their draw length probably is not going to work you know if you've got somebody who can get away with a 64 inch bow or a 66 great but we still want that bow to be tunable and forgiving so so we don't want to hand somebody who's got a 30 inch draw or a you know a 66 inch bow just to be able to get over their wheelchair think about that um draw weight and ability to reach the target so if somebody's got a condition that's going to impact their ability to get to a weight with a recurve that will get them to 70 meters yet they want to be competitive and that's what they want to do that that needs to be a conversation you have because um we all know that that 50 meters and, and using a, an efficient compound bow will get that distance at much lower poundage and so that's another thing to consider um the need for adaptations and modifications so if you've got somebody who can't grip the string or is going to need you know compounds can be more modified releases can be more modified if they're going to be shooting the recurve they've got to be able to draw it back with their fingers or their mouth admittedly but not with a um but not with a mechanical release so if in any way they're going to need some form of mechanics they're going to have to go down the compound route um and the consideration again for mouth tabs is that if if with a mouth tab that that draw length is going to be very short um you're going to struggle to get the distance if you know you, you're really reducing that that face angle that that point from um from under your chin you're taking it up depending on how big someone's chin is could be several inches you're really reducing that sight window so um even mouth tab users they, they need to be really tall with really long arms to be able to to get the distance with that or you know really really high draw weights but you're going to struggle because you, you're not going to get a, a, a long draw length out of that um and, all, and consider the ability to get to as close to good form as possible so um i always advocate that that you know try try and keep to as good as uh, as good form as what you'd coach an able-bodied athlete there will be changes necessary but if you can stay as close to the the basic principles of good form with one bow and not the other that then then choose that most importantly <clears throat> what is the athlete gonna what does the athlete want to do and are they going to enjoy it there are little bits of things to discuss with the athlete but at the end of the day it's their decision <coughs> excuse me it's them who's going to be shooting it they may only just want to come down and play and never get further than 50 yards. Fair enough. Let them choose what they want. But those, if someone wants to go up ahead and wants to be competitive, those are the areas of the things you need to um, to discuss with them. Um, on to my last slide. Um, 
so yeah so just a, a list of resources here um, I find um, someone asked about where we go where do we go for, for further information or when we need help on this really good question really great question I, I think this is a really good opportunity um, there seems like to be a, a lot of, of, of you coaches out there who are who are interested in this you know just just the attendance tonight shows that there's an interest in this um, so I need to stop you forming and um, forming a collective like please share information talk to one another that's the best way you're going to be able to share information and ideas and and try different things so so please try create community within yourselves um I, I use Twitter a lot for work and, and for following um people so um Dr Robert Townsend used to be a um PhD student at Loughborough University and his specialisation is disability archery and I attended some of his workshops and seminars and um, he now works in New Zealand but he posts quite a lot of good stuff and a lot of research around disability sport and um, disability coaching. Nick Diaper is um, in, he uh, in charge of para sport at Loughborough University. Um, Loughborough University are the first university to have a dedicated para sport um, head and, and division um, so a lot of good stuff comes out of there a lot of resources come out of there wheel power uh, charity um, getting um, disabled athletes into sport and a lot of athletes from uh, have come through via the wheel power UK coaching which I hope you're all aware of fantastic workshops they've been doing during this COVID-19 um, work Paracoach EU is relatively is something relatively new. They're going to be doing an online course, I believe, soon, uh, specifically around para coaching. I took part in some research they were doing around um, coaching uh, athletes with disabilities around um, Europe, and they're going to be coming up with some um, courses and content soon. So give them a follow. Uh, the British Paralympic Association, um, quite obvious. Um, and then the Peter Harrison Centre for Disability in Loughborough, um, fantastic research facility for athletes with disabilities and often have really good reports or resources on there or um, things that they're doing and looking for. And then just um, some of the links I mentioned. So the British Blind Sport um, link is there. Um, the classification page on World Archery, which will take you to... Um, the classification um, yeah you, yeah handbook classification handbook that's it um, so you can get further information on classification and it, it, much more detail than what I've talked about the International Paralympic Committee um, always a good place that's got the um, the IPC guide in there so that's the overarching guide that all sports and national governing bodies are um, have to adhere to activity alliance are a um a charity i think that gets the people into disability sport um they have got a training course on there about um inclusive activity coaching um so have a look at that because uh, i know that it's more of a face-to-face -face course and obviously they're not running at the moment but um anything like that i think is is really valid um, and then the BWAA, so the British Wheelchair Artery Association, um, based down at Stoke Mandeville, um, is a fantastic place for um, people with all disabilities to go and enjoy archery and train together. Um, and yeah, we, we have a lot of athletes who um, who still attend um, their weekend workshops when they're on um, and just love the, the, the feeling of community that that um, association brings.